What's good, Tinfoilers? So, were you surprised by the big reveal? Did you have any idea that Masa's father was... Wait, hold up. Before we go any further, let's get this out of the way from the jump. This is a spoiler-heavy video covering episode 8 of Sunny. Please be advised. Where was I? So yeah, I didn't imagine that Masa's father was the mild-mannered dude that we saw deliver Sonny to Susie in the first episode. Honestly though, this reveal makes so much sense after we witness Masa's backstory in this episode, and we get to see exactly how he became involved with robotics. And I definitely love the fact that this entire episode is dedicated to the retelling of it, and I think this episode gets the show back on the right track in terms of tone and pace. I am the Nautilus, and this is the breakdown of Sunny Episode 8. Trash or not trash. Now before we begin, a quick shout out to the Patreon fam. These gangsters help keep the lights on. I salute you. And a special shout out goes out to the newest additions to the crew, JMC JMC, Andy of CT, and Ahawk. Thank you so much for making the choice to support the dream. Your name will appear in the closing credits of every video going forward. Can't thank you enough. So I hope you guys are ready for some bobbleheaded robot action because it's time to dive. So as we already mentioned in episode eight of Trash or Not Trash, we learned that this dude is Masa's mysterious biological father we've all been dying to meet and we're given a flashback showing Masa's backstory. We start out witnessing the interactions or lack thereof with his stepfather, Shigeru. Yeah, it turns out that this stepfather of his, he doesn't like him too much. And poor Masa doesn't understand why it's like this. Shigeru didn't want anything to do with him because he took the attitude that this is not my kid, and therefore I have no responsibility. And this becomes an issue in Masa's life all the way into adulthood. We get a scene where we see Noriko preventing him from visiting his father, who's apparently about to pass away. And this snubbing shakes Masa to his core. This event ends up being the catalyst for his life of strict isolation, aka hikikomori. This goes on for years, leaving Noriko completely exasperated and she's at a loss for what to do. A couple years go by and Noriko turns to Hiromasa, desperately hoping that he can help her coax Masa out of his rut. Now Masa doesn't want to hear any of it until of course Hiromasa reveals to him that he is in fact his father. Hiromasa makes him a deal, offering him a quiet and remote place to stay in a cabin to clear his mind. This is where it all begins, where Masa begins a new chapter in his life, and it's all thanks to a trash robot that Hiromasa kept on the premises, named Sho. It's important to note that Sho has one of the best robot laughs I've ever heard. <laughs> it's Masa's discovery of this little guy, and his failed attempts at figuring out what to toss and what not to toss out as trash, that Masa sorta has an epiphany. So Masa wants to make the robot more efficient by making it able to tell the difference between trash and non-trash by changing the entire way the robot evaluates things. But in doing so, the robot ends up giving him new life. It's a pretty good exchange. Not only because it's given him something to do as in a goal to work towards, but it also puts him back in touch with his own humanity. See, interacting with the robot, trying to translate human perspective to a machine that exists solely in a world governed by logic, forces Masa to look at his own humanity and it's in this moment of recognition that he well feels like smiling again for the first time in forever. Masa is inspired and he wants others to experience this too. This spark is what puts him on the path to becoming a roboticist. He gets a remote gig at Ematech and continues his side projects in the privacy of the secluded cabin. Now in the opening, as Hiromasa is narrating, he talks about a thought experiment involving a beetle in a box, a reference to Wittgenstein. This is an allegory that's used to argue against the idea that words derive their meaning from private experiences. When you say a word like love or pain, it has a different meaning to the listener because we don't know what other people are experiencing internally. The idea here is that the meaning arises from the public shared use of language and not from some inner private experience. A small but interesting detail in this section of the episode is in the part where Masa is listening to his father explain how he was involved in the programming of the game that Masa was playing in his room. And he mentions that he didn't patch the game properly and instructs Masa on how to use this to exploit the game. This is a future reference to the backdoor that Masa has written in his own code that allows him to manipulate the robots in ways that are normally out of bounds. This is essentially the beginning of the dark manual. When Masa is rifling through Hiromasa's files, he finds a Kit Kat bar and this triggers a memory for him. And we learn that Hiromasa did appear in his life when he was a little kid, proving that he did want to be involved. So we might conclude that there's some extenuating circumstances behind why he was never around. But one thing I gotta say, have you ever heard of diabetes? 
Noriko and Hiromasa seem to get along well. There are even a few moments where you get the sense that there could still be a flame burning between these two. So what gives? Why did she ice this man out of their lives? At one point, Masa finds some pictures of a younger Noriko and Masa, and they look like any young couple in love, which Masa finds very triggering. Later on, when Noriko comes to visit, he confronts her about this, but she doesn't want to give an answer. Instead, she exits stage left. Every time this issue comes up, she shuts down, and I get more and more curious. Also interesting to note that the beetle and the crow appear in this episode, two animals that appear in the intro. This is making me want to take a closer look at that intro for the next video. The entire story is probably right there if we could only decipher the symbolisms. This needs further investigation. Okay, let's talk about Zen and the trackers fiasco. Mixie is the first to spot a new tracker signal. As in before, we were told that there were three signals and now we find that there are four. We're meant to believe that the other two trackers must be Zen and Masa, in addition to Noriko and Susie. After doing some investigative work, Susie and company determined that on the day of their departure, trackers for both Zen and Masa are seen going to the airport, but then leaving it implying that they never got on the plane. So naturally, Susie discovers this and she's off to the races. So this is good news, right? They didn't go down in a plane crash. Turns out Noriko was right. And I'm giving her some side eye for that. Susie heads off to the location of one of the trackers she believes is Zen. And while in the building, she starts to hear what sounds like Zen's voice calling for her. Now in the sequence, Susie spots Zen at the end of a hallway. Yahtzee, we found the boy. Or maybe that's a question. We found the boy? Now Zen doesn't seem to be too enthused about seeing Susie, which I thought was kind of strange. But maybe he was just scared. But anyway, it made me wonder what was really going on here because this whole thing feels like a trap. And what we do witness for certain is Sunny looks different. Like the way she looks when she's that other version of herself. She looks a little aggro is all I'm saying. As Susie gets closer to Zen, Himei's right hand sneaks up on her with a pistol and it looks like it's curtains for her until Susie flips the script and takes out the thug. Once again, using a little trickery. This scene kind of solidifies the theory that Sunny was sent to Susie by Masa to protect her. And it's special programming makes it really good at that. This also explains why Sunny tripped out and punched Mixie way back when. I think it's part of her guard dog programming. But this begs the question, why did Sunny bludgeon that man with the chair in the opening of episode one? Or was that the Yakuza manipulating her? Now that's a question for later. So what the heck happens in the end of this episode, the very final scene? You see this strange sequence where reality starts disintegrating before our eyes, but it's all digital-like. Normally, I'd say this is a dramatic rendition of Sunny shutting down from her perspective and with a healthy dose of a creative license. But some of the shots make it look like Susie is the one seeing the digital decay. I don't want to go too far out on a limb, but is Susie okay here? After watching it a second time, I think this shot is meant to tell us that Sunny is in her own version of the sunken place. Maybe it's the visual representation of her base personality being repressed somehow, buried in the programming. And this is how the director chose to portray her sliding back down into the subconscious, as it were. We'll see. At the time of writing this, episode 9 drops tomorrow. I'll definitely get episodes 9 and 10 out a lot faster than this one. I wasn't sure if I was even going to do this at the time. So anyway, that's all for now. Episode 9 is on the way. If you enjoyed this video, you already know what to do. Stay safe and stay sane out there. Be good to yourself. And until next time, off you go.